This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. A cattle market update with Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz starts today's show. Lee talks about the current market as well as reports on land values and cash rent and why a producer might want to adopt a blackjack strategy for feeding cattle. K-State Extension farm economist Greg Ivendahl keeps the show rolling by discussing the reports he puts together on crop conditions and soil conditions in Kansas. Drew Ricketts, K-State Wildlife Specialist, ends today's show with information about the Wildlife Habitat Education Program. He explains what the program is and what youth can learn and how they can compete. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update with Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz. Lee, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Lee, what are we seeing on the cash side of things for the cattle market? Well, you're seeing a bit of, of cash and futures, I, I would say, kind of not reflecting what the other's doing. Now, as, as we look at last week, uh, markets were down, if you look at really across the board, both futures and from a cash standpoint. But cash, really, if you look across the countryside, was about $2 lower from the prior week. But when you compare that to the futures market, futures were down in the near term, live cattle contract over four and a half dollars per hundred weight. You go further out, it's even worse. As you got into December, you're over down over seven dollars over the, the previous week. Feeder cattle, similar sentiment there, down from 10 to roughly 12 to $13 per hundred weight. So really, when you look at the futures market, there's been a lot of pressure. I, I call it some technical pressure as we're getting into a contract month on both the live cattle and the feeder cattle contract. It may be a bit of, you know, looking for some fresh news. If you're looking for any negative news impacting futures, we, we had a report last week about H5N1 and looking at uh, some of the, the impacts, on, or at least some of the detection on workers maybe have gone undetected. So maybe there's a few more out there. Again, not new news, but it is some negative sentiment into the, the markets. Also, we had last week uh, with the power outage in Omaha, you know, that had an impact on a packer there, not being able to operate just due to the, the power outage. So again, a bit of negative news on the marketplace, but it doesn't change any of the fundamentals of overall tight fed cattle supplies. And that's what I think would be what's holding the cash markets where it's at. What about for box beef, Lee? So I'll, I'll remind you know our listeners here, we're, we're kind of in a bit of an inflection point as you look at box beef, cutout values. We, we have started coming off some of the summer highs. You know, I'll look at last week. Really, last week, we were pretty steady, though, with the prior week. I think you got to point to some of that was slaughter levels were, were down notably. Um, if you look through Saturday of the week, we were down 3.6% compared to a year ago levels. So tighter slaughter levels have held up some of those box beef values, but we're starting to, again, see those come down from some of the summer highs that we've seen. Lee, wanting to talk about a few reports that have recently come out, and the first one involving agricultural land values. Yeah, so I think it's a good time as as we're not maybe getting a lot of news hitting the the cattle markets. We can talk about some of the peripheral kind of fundamentals in, in the marketplace. And USDA this last week gave us a couple of surveys that we can bring our attention to. First one here on land values. They're really measuring agricultural land values. They do it by state and by region and nationally. The three main ones here are farm real estate. So it's farm land and building. So think about it as buying a whole farm. Then you can also get cropland. They put that irrigated and, and non-irrigated and then pasture land. And so Maybe if we just, for, for sake of time here, we can kind of focus on the cropland values. Uh, so for the U.S., the average here, and remember, these are big averages when you look across the whole country and all different types of, of cropland you have there. Uh, the average there was $5,570 there in 2024. That is up 4.7%. If we compare maybe Iowa here, uh, so where where I'm at, land values are $9,800 on average. That was up 4.1% from 2023. 
Kansas, where, where you're at, Shelby, their land values on average were $3,300 and up 7.1% compared to, to 2023. That was cropland. Again, remember, there's a lot of varying crops and types of land, so that, that is an average there. Pasture land for the U.S. was $1,830 on average, and that's the 2024 value. That's 5.2% higher than 2023. Here in, in Iowa, pasture land is, is up 10.4% compared to a year ago, um, and in Kansas at $2,100 per acre for value, that's up 8.8% for crop land. So kind of overall, not many surprises as we're getting, the, as we look at some of the auction data or hear about sales of continue increase in the, those land values. Um, I think the question there is, do we start to see that slow down a little bit or, or peaking? So not the large year over year increases, you know, I would say, you know, we're still seeing some of that on some tracts of land, but also I think we're starting to see that cool a little bit. And, and when you particularly look at the averages, maybe that's starting to come through. Do you see a correlation between these values and maybe what cattle producers are doing? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you think about land values, those are not much um, kind of on the day-to-day -day impacts. And I think importantly, you know, that that's not kind of impacted by the, the current fundamentals. You know, let's talk about cash rents then, uh, which was another survey. And certainly that you can think about impacts kind of that crop year, right? Or that uh, year when you think about grazing um, and costs for cow-calf producers, when you look at, at some of those pasture land values. So here, as, as we look at crop land, that was up. This is cash rent here. Um, in the United States, uh, we, we've seen those values up about $5 per acre or 3.2%. That kind of hit the middle as I look where Iowa and Kansas were up. So Iowa was up 2.6%. Uh, Kansas was up 3.4% on cash rent on, on cropland acres. When you look at, at pasture land, uh, Iowa was up 5%. Kansas up 2.3%. So again, I think we're starting to maybe see some of those cool off a little bit um, from the large hikes we've seen over the last couple of years, especially when you look at the cropland values. That really aligns where we're seeing crop prices, right? So as, as those crop prices have come down, I think that's pressured margins and pressured kind of willingness to pay higher and higher rates for the, those values. That's not to say they haven't remained at historic highs, though, right? Now, the question when you look at pasture land values is, where we're currently seeing calf prices and return to profitability for cow-calf producers, does that really start to see some uh, or incentivize paying higher and higher values for some of those pasture land acres? Lee, as we're talking about the different things that might be impacting the cattle market, you wrote an article recently that's titled, Adopt a Blackjack Strategy to Feeding Cattle. And what do you mean by that? So part of the title is uh, maybe trying to get to get a little flick bait um, on there. Um, but I also do think there's some similarities when we think about playing blackjack and marketing crops and, and cattle. And, and so bear with me for a second. We'll, we'll kind of talk through it here a little bit. Some strategies when you think about playing blackjack are splitting pairs and, and doubling down. So in both of those scenarios, uh, you're effectively putting more chips on the table. Right. And, and there's obviously reasons you do that because you're wanting to win the hand or win more for the particular hand. Right. Um, and I always think about this from the case of I'm on the side of I like to play it real safe uh, when I'm playing blackjack. But doing so, sometimes you're converting a really favorable hand into a wasted opportunity. So as we think about this year and, and marketing corn and, and marketing cattle, um, you may say, it's, well, if you look at where the markets are currently at, there's not one that's really offering a win-win, right? As we look at season average corn price, um, USDA has it in that 430 to 440 range. If you look at the futures markets, it's 410. Well, both of those are much lower than corn production costs. Um, and so marketing corn this year um, doesn't look like a huge value proposition. Now there's opportunities to store and things like that. On the flip side, marketing cattle, uh, you know, we're seeing very volatile returns. 2024 is maybe break even. 2025 looks a bit worse right now, but historically you can't really lock, lock in profit. So, you know, the question is here, you know, what do we do as a strategy? You know, is there an opportunity to mark, market corn through cattle or walk that corn off the, the farm through the cattle and add value to that, that corn right? Now, I think the concern is when you look at feeder cattle prices, right? So feeder cattle prices 
are historically high. Uh, so that's a big risk for producers, right? Because you're you're one, you're having to have this high purchase price, right? Interest rates are as high as they've been since 2007. So that's really increased that, that expense as well. So there's a lot of more risk to take here when you're thinking about these. But I would also argue that there's a higher reward because where we're seeing cattle prices are at, I think the fundamentals we hit on briefly earlier, very tight cattle supplies and potential for fed cattle prices to get much stronger into the spring here, you know, that could add really a lot of value to that corn marketing it through through cattle. What maybe should producers do? Yeah, so I, I would sum it up like this. When you're thinking about splitting pairs in blackjack, there's two reasons you do that. One's defensive, right? So you're breaking up a pair that is not not a great value right now for, for yourself. Um, and the other one is an attack. So maybe the dealer doesn't have a really good hand. And so you want to go on the attack there. Right now, we're very defensive, right? Uh, because you, you could argue corn or cattle, it's not, not a great hand that, that we've been dealt by the market so far. But you have to be in the game to win the game. And I think that's where it kind of goes goes on the attack. So if there is a potential that these markets change, and in particular from a cattle feeding standpoint, you want to have those cattle on feed. And so where you may turn that into an attack or doubling down potentially is where you need to be in this game. So, you know, my, my suggestion is I think it is a viable option this year to market that corn to the cattle. It adds risk for a producer, but it may be a risk worth taking given where, you know, I think the potential is for these markets to go. That was Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz. I will link the reports and his article in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Monday show talking about conditions and estimates for crops and soil moisture with K-State Extension farm economist Greg Ivendahl. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. Greg, can you tell us about how these reports and publications are put together? Well, there's several sources of data I use when I'm trying to predict yields for the state, and I've predicted yields for both wheat, corn, and soybeans uh, for the last couple of years. But the USDA NAS, they collect data for not only for the soil conditions, but also on the crop conditions over the weekend every week, and then they report those on Monday. So it's really some of the most commonly collected data that they use. They collect it on a weekly basis. There's not too many other reports that they actually collect that often. And then they report it very quickly, too. So again, they're collecting data probably, I think, from Thursday through Sunday, and then they compile those. And Monday afternoon, both the uh, USDA crop conditions for all the major crops are reported, as along with the soil moisture content. So that's very recent data, good data. They kind of do some surveys, and they report it at the state level. So that's one set of data that I'm using in my estimates. And then there's also another set of data that I use for kind of a complementary report. The U.S. Drought Monitor from the University of Nebraska, they also report data on a weekly basis. They're, They're basically just looking at the percent of state that's in drought, and they report those usually on Thursday afternoon. But the advantage of the Nebraska drought monitor data is that they report more than just the state level. They go down, really down to the county level. So if I want to do some fine tuning and maybe look at specific crop reporting districts or specific counties, I have that drought monitor data to look at too. And I've, I've used both sets of data really to try to predict yields for the state. And looking at things from the USDA NAS numbers, what is it looking like for Kansas corn in terms of their condition? First point out, too, that when uh, USDA NAS uh, estimates uh, crop conditions, they report that as five categories. They're looking at basically the percent of crop in excellent all the way down to the uh, percent crop that's very poor. And they report that as a percent of the crop for the whole state. So obviously, you know, that's a state number. So I'm going to kind of maybe miss some of the uh, spots in the state where there's a drought because it's just kind of an overall number. That's I guess that would be one of the limitations of doing that. And again, it's just a percent of the crop in each of those five categories. So when you sum those five categories together, it will, it will turn out to be 100% because there's really no overlap. So I have a model. I first saw this model uh, about five or ten years ago or so. Someone used it as a predictor of crop yields. I'm kind of using their same model. So basically, I I have a weight that, you know, basically gives a score of one to the percent of crop in the best category down to a zero for the percent of crop in the worst category. Then I get an index. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at those index values for a specific wheat over the last 20 to 30 
years and to kind of develop a regression model to look at estimating what the uh, yield might be. So let's say maybe I get like, uh, in my model maybe has a score like maybe like, uh, let's say 75. I can go back and look at the past 20 to 30 years in my model and say, well, what, what does that mean for what a yield might be this year? And really for corn, the model does very, very well. My last report that I did basically has a, has an R squared value. You know, R squared values can range from negative one to to a positive one. I'm basically getting numbers in like the 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.7 range, which is very very good. So my my corn yield prediction, I think, is pretty good for all the states. I'm basically estimating for the national level. I'm estimating all the 18 major corn states. And then aggregating that up to get a national corn yield. And I'm kind of doing the same thing for soybeans. Soybeans, it doesn't work near as well because it's really hard to judge the condition of soybean just based on what they look like in the field. You know, they can look really, really bad and you still end up getting a, a pretty good yield, kind of way that the wheat sometimes does that kind of fools you. Corn is more straightforward. You know, corn looks bad in the field, you're probably going to have a bad yield. If it looks pretty good, you're probably going to have a good yield. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind for that. Really looking at this from a national perspective, we are going to have a very, very good corn yield this year, even though there's certainly going to be parts of the country and, and parts of all the states where that's not the case here. Looking at, like, Illinois especially, they're going to have a very, very good yield, what I'm seeing so far, well above their trend line yield, which is well over 200 bushel per acre. Here in Kansas, I think our corn yields are going to be better than what they were last year. Obviously, they're starting to see some, you know, indications of drought showing up right now. But looking at my last model report, I'm really looking at a corn yield probably about – Oh, six or seven bushels higher than last year. Last year was certainly, you know, a bad yield for corn. So we have that going on. Um, and there's other states like North Carolina. They're, they're looking at probably really, really, really bad yields this year for their corn yield, well below what their trend line yield would be. But a lot of the other states are higher. So I think overall the U.S. corn yield is going to be pretty good. Soybeans in the state of Kansas, I think, are going to be a lot better, too. I think looking at my last report, I'm about 10 bushel higher than what we were last year. But again, last year was a very off year. So I, th- I think we're going to, just looking at overall things, I think in Kansas, I think our both our corn and soybean yields are probably going to be average to certain, maybe above average possibly, but certainly not the situation last year where we saw pretty extreme droughts. Now, again, saying that, there are going to be areas of the state where they're going to suffer more than other ones. Again, this is kind of a uh, state number. So even though I, I'm saying we're going to have average yields or maybe a little bit above, there's certainly certainly going to be areas of the state where that's not the case. And there's a section within these reports that's harvested acres. And what are you looking at for that for this time of year? The USDA NAS, they also, when they, they report, they do surveys every spring and throughout the summer where they're looking at the number of acres planted and the number of acres harvested. So I'm, I'm basically taking my harvested acre number directly from what NAS tells me what they're estimating it's going to be. At I, I, one time I was trying to predict harvested acres from the planted acres. That didn't have a very good fit. So I'm just basically using what NAS tells me for what they sort of survey says for the harvested acres are going to be. It's certainly going to be lower than what the planted acres are going to be because there are going to be acres that are going to be abandoned and such that don't actually get harvested. So it's always going to be a lower number. But again, that first number from NAS about harvested acres comes out in the middle of June. And that, that's the one I'm using to base my estimates for when I'm calculating total production for corn and soybeans. Greg, can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing for crop production when it comes to using the drought monitor from Nebraska? Okay, that's a little bit of different data than what the USDA NAS has. So NAS is reporting on the crop conditions, and they're basically going from excellent down to very poor. What I'm using for the drought monitor stuff, even though it's a, a lot more fine-tuned data, I can go down to the, the crop reporting district, which I have in my reports from Ag Manager, is they're just looking at the percent of the state in drought. And again, they have different levels of drought from no drought down to a very, very extreme drought. And I'm kind of using an index like I did for the crop conditions from NAS as a way to develop a yield model. My only weakness there is I don't really have numbers from that drought monitor that, that tells me the percent of soil that has excess or surplus moisture, which would be very helpful to have if I was trying to do an estimate. So basically, as long as the soil is not in drought, it basically gives you me a score of zero for a drought condition. But I can't tell if there's excess moisture there. But it, it still provides a fairly good estimate. I would argue that it's probably not as strong as what the crop conditions report number is. But when I'm comparing my two models from the one from NAS and the one using the drought monitor, the soybean number is almost spot on. They're almost exactly the same. When I'm looking at the corn one, though, there probably is about a 10 bushel difference in that drought monitor number versus what the USDA number is. I would say if I had to make a choice, I would say the USDA number is better, so I would go with that one. But again, it is more fine-tuned, and I can use that. So the one thing about the drought monitor stuff is that it's kind of based on the theory that 
July moisture makes corn yield grain. Uh, Scott Irwin from Illinois has has posted about that. that's actually the biggest factor to, in the determinant of what corn yields are is how much July moisture you get. Well, I can I can kind of use that as a guide in, in my uh, drought monitor stuff to look at what corn yields might be. I'm, and my thinking there is that maybe the July numbers for the drought monitor thing may be a better predictor of final yields than maybe looking at some of these drought monitor conditions later on in August here. So I'm, I'm going to go back and try to revise that drought monitor one, maybe look at the total drought conditions during July, maybe as a predictor of corn and soybean yields as well to see what my final yield might be. So I think there's some work to do with that one. I kind of like it because it is, again, more fine-tuned than what the USDA number is. And as we look at all these reports, another one that's in there is soil moisture conditions. Yeah, I basically just report that as a moment for the moment. I'm not really using it as a predictor for everything. It, when you go back and, and do a regression and kind of compare what the soil moisture is to what the yield one might be based on crop condition, there's probably going to be a high correlation there. I'm just kind of reporting that right now because I think that, that is of, of interest to people is what is the drought condition. So you can go to the drought monitor and look at that as well here. Again, the USDA number is going to show the percent of soil that has excess moisture, so there is that. They also report both topsoil and subsoil moisture conditions. Now, when I've looked at this in the past, I really don't see a whole lot of difference in the reporting based on the percent of state that has excess moisture and other moisture levels for both subsoil and topsoil between the topsoil and subsoil reports that they produce here. So apparently they do this by surveys as well. Here I was thinking well, maybe they do, they do a lot of fancy satellite techniques, but apparently they don't. It's a lot of more, they, you know, they use some county agents and some other folks to go out and do some surveys. I'm not really sure how these folks are actually going out and determining what the subsoil moisture is. I can't really imagine a lot of folks going out and making a, you know, digging through the soil profile and, and looking at the soil moisture profile. So I think they're doing some estimates there. I would argue that it's probably better than, you know, not having any data at all, but it's probably not as good as what it potentially could be if they had some fancier ways to survey that kind of stuff. Greg, if people would like to check out these reports and see them as you do update them, how do you recommend they do that? Well, you can go to agmanager.info. Again, the uh, USDA numbers come out in um, on Mondays, and I try to report usually something back on Tuesdays. I try to, not necessarily every week, but on a fairly regular schedule, I try to do those. The U.S. Uh, drought monitor stuff from Nebraska comes out on Thursdays, and I try to report those either by Friday or Monday. Again, not every week, but at least uh, several times during the growing season. Greg, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us kind of an update on some reports you're doing around conditions and estimates for crops and soil. Glad to do that. Uh, again, it ties in with some of the other work I'm doing when I'm looking at trying to come up with uh, net farm income estimates because I do use these uh, yield predictions in my model for net farm income. That was K-State Extension farm economist Greg Ibendahl. You can find these publications by going to agmanager.info, and I will link them in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Monday show talking with K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. Drew, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shelby. Drew, school's about to start and wanting to mention the Wildlife Habitat Education Program at K-State. Absolutely. So it's it's not necessarily a program at K-State, but I just got back from helping with the national contest in Texas. And so it's kind of on my mind and it's a good time to talk about it. The Wildlife Habitat Education Program is the name of the, the program, and we just call it WEP for short, W-H-E-P. It's really a wildlife management-based curriculum that high school ag teachers could use for an environmental science piece. It's also, you know, high school biology teachers could use it for ecology or, or wildlife management related things. It's used in 4-H sometimes as its own independent activity. It's also used like the wildlife project for some 4-Hers. But basically, it's an educational curriculum that focuses on helping youngsters understand and learn about wildlife habitat management. So it really starts off with how things like fire and grazing and processes like succession, which is that plant turnover through time, create wildlife habitat and different kinds of wildlife habitat. And it also, the youngsters learn about wildlife habitat requirements for different species. They learn what food items are food for different critters. They learn how to identify food items and those sorts of things. And this is really quite an in-depth competition with four different events and two of those being individual. 
Yeah, that's true. So, you know, to do the wildlife habitat education program, you wouldn't have to participate in the contest, but there are state level contests every year and then there's a national contest. And so that contest, it's really designed to have this the participants understand all those things I talk about and then also apply them. So the individual pieces are the wildlife challenge, and that's a general knowledge and identification activity. It's really, it's kind of an exam, like a lab practical exam, where the participants are given questions like, what is a community? And the students would need to know that a community is the collection of plants and animals that interact in an area. And a different question might be, what is a population? And we need to know that that's all of the individuals of a species in an area. And so they're learning these different ecological terms. They'd also identify things like they might be given a bat specimen and they'd have to know that that's uh, this species of bat or they might be given a bird specimen that they have to identify or a picture. They even have to identify sounds. So they might identify a metal art call. And food items. So we might give them a specific plant that is important for a species, or we might give them an invasive species that's important for the environment. So the next piece is what we call wildlife management practices. In that activity, we have a a sheet of paper that's got a set of wildlife management practices that we teach them about in the book. And then they, across the top, they would have a, a collection of species that should be in that area. And they have to, they're given a site and a scenario about that site and and they evaluate that site as habitat for all these different species and then mark which practices are appropriate for that species to produce the habitat that that species needs in that area. What about the team events at this contest? Sure. So the team events are the wildlife management plan, which a group of three to four participants would evaluate an area as habitat based on a scenario that they're given and then write a management plan and draw a map for how to implement that management plan for those species at that site. And then the last piece is oral reasons. So then each member of the team would tell us how they managed that area for those different species. And we'd give them a set of questions that sort of prompt uh, their responses about that. If people are interested in finding out more information about this wildlife habitat education program, how can they do that? There's several different ways. At the national level, we've got a website. It's whep.org. That's a great resource. At the state level, reach out to your local extension office, and probably the 4-H agent there, if you have one, would know information. You can reach out directly to me if you're in Kansas. Uh, But probably reach out to your local extension office about that. That was K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow.